Greetings, Beatle fans. Welcome to another edition of Things We Said Today. This is a bi-weekly podcast that discusses everything and anything about the Beatles, together, solo, two of them at the same time, three out of the four, whatever the case might be. We'll discuss it here on Things We Said Today. I'm Darren DeVivo uh, from WFUV Radio in New York City, one of the three hosts of Things We Said Today. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome my co-hosts. You know them as longtime Beatle radio program host. 37 years of doing Beatles radio programs. Used to be on WDHA in northern New Jersey and was on uh, XM radio for a while. Currently hosting Every Little Thing, which is uh, broadcast live on Wednesday nights at 8 o'clock on WNHU in Connecticut. And also available in a multitude of other places. And he's also the co-host of uh, one of four hosts of Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast that happens every Monday night at 9 o'clock on Facebook. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Ken Michaels. Hi, Darren. I think we're out of time now. I think we're out of time. We filled up the whole hour there. Uh, Uh, My credits. Well, stop doing so much stuff. (laughs) Wait till he gets to my book title. Me, it's me. It's it's easy. It's Darren DeVivo from WFUV. So, uh, so welcome to Ken and also uh, our other co-host, Alan Cozen. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) Alan's got a resume as well, folks. Alan uh, has written thousands upon thousands of books. He's uh, uh, a music critic for the New York Times for nearly four decades and an author of several Beatle books, including The Beatles, From the Cavern to the Rooftop, and Got That Something, How the Beatles' I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything. And, um, And here he is, ladies and gentlemen, the one and only, and let's be thankful there's only one, Alan Cozen. Why, thank you, Darren, and hello, everybody. Ken's going to get us started, as we usually do with the news. We've got a couple of uh, big news things that kind of exploded today, although we knew this was going to happen. We knew at least one of these announcements was coming, was imminent. And then we'll have a discussion about, you have to hang out and find out. And we'll get to our today's topic after the news is up. So, Ken, it's all yours. You know, Darren hasn't even told the show what the topic is, so it's going to be, no. we're going to be completely yeah. spontaneous. Right, they don't even That's know one. what we're you know what? I don't even know what we're going to talk about. <laughs> we're just going to wing knows. it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I, we we're do know. We're going to figure it out by text message while <laughs> Ken's doing the news. <laughs> so uh, let's check the news with Ken, and then we'll get into today. We'll get into today's topic. Okay. Well, we're doing this show on August the seventh, which is strange because we hardly ever record on a Wednesday. But news has leaked out, and I guess the official word will be tomorrow about the Abbey Road box set coming out, which the date that we've been given is September the 27th. Actually, tomorrow, August the 8th, is the anniversary of when the Beatles did their their walk on the crosswalk, correct? Yes, Alan? that's true. <laughs> that's right. So there's supposed to be a big uh, party, launch party, I believe, at Abbey Road Studios to oh, wow. announce the box set for this. And um, as we have heard, there's going to be a remix for Abbey Road for the album that Charles Martin has done. Two CDs worth of uh, outtakes from the Abbey Road sessions and then a Blu-ray as well. And uh, I do have a quote because actually um, Ringo Starr was talking about this within the past week uh, confirming the Abbey Road box set release. And he has said, this is a quote from him, I've loved all the re-releases because of the remastering, and you can hear the drums, which got dialed down in the old days. I get a bit fed up personally with all those, like, take nine or take three, the odd takes that we didn't put out, but that's part of the box set, and you have to do stuff like that. But I've always just listened to the record itself, what we put out in the 60s or 1970, and it's brighter It's amazing with Beatles music. We have a billion streams a year now, and every generation still has a listen to us far out. So that's uh, Ringo's point of view on uh, the upcoming box set. Interesting how he talks about the outtakes, that he's not really crazy about them. Yeah. Putting them out, and yet I always thought with the Beatles, everything has to be agreed upon with all four parties, so... 
I, think, I guess. I think that because um, Paul actually does kind of like them, you know, Ringo is just sort of, you know, acceding to to that. And, and the fact that, as he says in his quote, that, you know, you kind of have to these days. I'm not sure you really have to, but I'm glad he thinks so. <laughs> mm-hmm. He wouldn't be the first um, veteran artist that I've heard say that the outtakes don't really knock them out. You know, that it's kind of like it's it. we're the ones that dig it. So that's why. Oh, look, I'm digging it. We're the ones that dig it. And that's why it's done. Yeah. Right. Uh, you know, I don't know. I, I, I talked to Paul about bootlegs at one point and he basically, you know, he went from, you know, this is a, these are the takes we chose and we chose them for a reason. And then he said, you know, but on the other hand, you know, you put together a a charismatic little tape of outtakes that, you know, have interesting things in them. And yeah, I like those too. So, you know, he was okay about it. And, uh, I think, I think the experience of the anthology obviously didn't affect Ringo that much according to, you know, this particular quote, but I think that, uh, George and Paul felt that they were discovering things that were really kind of interesting that they'd completely forgotten about you know, in the versions that they didn't release. Um, I thought that doing the anthology kind of changed their minds about it. But, you know, like with any artist, there's, there's always two ways of looking at it. One is, you know, we are putting out the best in our uh, opinion of what we've done and everything else is just the work tapes or the sketches or whatever and it's not for the public to see. And the other point of view is that, you know, you, when you're a group as important as the Beatles, there are people who want to study what you've done and how you've done it. And, you know, why did this album come together this way? And the only way you're going to get that information is is listening to the outtakes. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, I'm reminded of, and I brought this up a few times, the first time we had Dave Morell here on the show. And this was at the time of Press to Play. And Dave was talking to Paul about sessions and, um, you know, outtakes of Beatles songs. And Paul said that he was concerned about putting out different takes of songs because new fans are not going to know what's the accepted version. You know, if it's Can't Buy Me Love, take 20, they might think that that's the one that counts. That's the one that matters, you know, and they might get confused by it. But um, evidently he's changed his opinion. Yeah, good. Mm -hmm. (laughs) <laughs> but do you think you think George um, was affected by the Beatles anthology and all these these outtakes? You think that he maybe gained a new appreciation for for different takes of the songs, Alan? I have a feeling he probably did. I'm not sure why I have that feeling though. I mean, it was just it's just the impression that I had, you know, from back when I worked on all that stuff. But you know, George wasn't talking much then either so Mm. couldn't really get his take on it but uh you know there's you know footage of them all sitting around the the console with george martin listening to things fading up that little solo in um here comes the sun stuff like that Um, right so you know and and not to mention you know he brought things in or he had he, he sometimes had alternate ideas, you know, okay, well, I don't mind putting this out, but we've got to edit it because it's too self-indulgent. You know, self-indulgent right. was one of his criticisms. So he shortened the version of Shout that right. they included, and he shortened the version of You Know My Name, Look Up the Number. Fortunately for us, all the stuff he cut out was on the released version on the single so that you could restore it using the single. It's just that the restoration would hop back and forth between stereo and mono. Hmm. Okay. Very interesting. All right. Other news. And this was announced last week is, uh, the word that the documentary, John and Yoko above us, only sky previously shown on AMC and Netflix will be coming out on DVD, Blu-ray and digitally. Uh, This explores the unique relationship and the artistic journey that culminated in John's iconic Imagine album, and it includes footage from the rehearsals at John and Yoko's home at Tittenhurst Park, 
that hadn't been shown before, even in the documentary for Give Me Some Truth. And there are interviews with Yoko, Klaus Vormann, Jim Keltner, Alan White, Julian Lennon, and uh, pioneering studio designer Eddie Veal. And the release date for that will be September 13th. Mm -hmm. So it looks like we'll be getting that as well as the Abbey Road box set in September. Mm Mm-hmm. All right. By the way, along with this uh, announcement of today, which it it should become official tomorrow on August the 8th, they're saying, and there's no confirmation about this yet, that the next McCartney remaster will be for Flaming Pie. Right. And not for London Town and Back to the Egg, which uh, had been rumored ever since the last batch of McCartney remasters for Wildlife and Red Rose Speedway. Is that a surprise to you guys? A little. Yeah, to me, I was wondering how far the the, uh, the reissues would be going. I was wondering if, like, the cutoff point was going to be Pipes of Peace or Paul would go on further now that we know that Flaming Pie might very well be coming. <laughs> Does that mean that there, <laughs> there would be a Give My Regards to Broad Street uh, release? But uh, that was the main thing that surprised me. I've always felt that Paul was, re- he's not releasing these albums in chronological order. And I think that's good because it kind of mixes things up. It allows other albums to stand next to, or, you know, later albums to stand next to early and vice versa. I'm glad he's doing it. There's probably tons of material uh, to do a nice set. We know there's a bunch of unreleased tracks. Um, so I really wasn't surprised when it was announced you know that it would be flaming pie i did think i'll tell you where my mind went and immediately it was like here we go again we've got flaming pot we got abbey road we got flaming pie i forgot all about the blue the blue rain dvd of the john and yoko film it's all going to come out at the same time at the end of the year and money will be flying out of my wallet <laughs> just like last year when it was imagine and the white album and the wings reissues yeah, maybe they should do this at tax refund time instead. <laughs> but, you know, they have gone, you were saying you, you thought they might go through Pipes of Peace, but they actually had gotten up to Flowers in the Dirt. Which right. Oh, right, right, right. I'm sorry. Yes, I'm yeah. sorry. I forgot about Flowers in the Dirt. But yeah, yeah, I guess yeah. when that came out, I realized, all right, well, we know they're going to, Paul's going this far. I wonder if he would take it beyond at what point do, can you, can you know, do you reissue albums that technically aren't quote unquote that old does off the ground you know is that going to be coming out so but i guess if flaming pie is being brought up in the conversation of reissues then it is entirely possible sure that uh you know off the ground and, and later albums and maybe even give my regards to broad street or something like that might be getting the reissue treatment yeah I, I don't I, see why not, really, because, um, you know, this is a guy whose archives are about as deep as, you know, like the Library of Congress. You know, I mean, he ha- he does <laughs> he does dozens and dozens of, you know, not only takes of the songs that that we know and different mixes of the songs we know. I mean, before before Flaming Pie came out, there was a three song sampler that that came out and the mixes on on a couple of those songs are different than yeah. what was eventually released um you know but apart from all that there's like a gazillion outtake songs you know i mean there's always extra stuff to fill these boxes out and the documentation has always been pretty good not as you know i, I mean for me i would like to have you know complete recording dates and all that stuff but fairly soon We'll all be getting that. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Gee, like, gee where? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like and I thought Darren. it was going to be the first item in the news this week. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll do an edit here. <laughs> no. We'll make that the next one, though. But, um, yeah, I'm very pleased about it being Flaming Pie. Obviously, I would have loved it if it was London Town and Back to the Egg, but I do like the fact that he jumps around in the different decades and mixes it up. Mm-hmm. But it'll always be interesting to me to to see what he picks as bonus material because with certain albums, he'd put out CD singles and the bonus material might be songs that were fairly old at the time and not even from those sessions. That's right. You know, because he had a lot of Ubu Jubu stuff. Mm-hmm. That was uh, part of the bonus tracks for Flaming Pie. Right. Uh, 
you know, so it's not necessarily from that period. That's Just right. like, uh, you know, songs like Same Time Next Year would mm-hmm. probably be somewhere in the London town Back to the Egg period, mm-hmm. you know, and that was a bonus track from Put It There. Yeah. And Mama's Little Girl, that kind of stuff. So where he places all this stuff, I find fascinating, too. Yeah. yeah. But uh, we shall see. And then we don't even know if there's going to be anything on John or George or Ringo, solo-wise, for the rest of the year yet. Anyway. Well, apart from the John documentary that, that you mentioned. So that's true. something. Yeah, I'm still hoping for one-to-one to come yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, in a way, um, the Above Us Only Sky is really last year's project. I mean, we've all seen it and everything. So now the Blu-ray's coming out, but, you know, it's not like, you know, last year we had the whole Imagine uh, extravaganza with the book and the DVD and Blu-ray and the um, multi-disc album set and all that. And, And this is just really the tail end of that. So maybe Yoko has in mind something actually new that we haven't thought of and one to one would be a a good uh, a good choice, I suppose. Well if you remember last year we only found out about the Imagine box set, I don't know, a month <laughs> before it was gonna come out. It was fairly soon. Mm-hmm. So uh you never know. Usually it'll be around John's birthday when something comes out. So mm. if there is going to be something on John we'll know Probably this month or or early next month, Mm -hmm. I would think. Anyway, but what many people might consider far more important news than all of this is uh, an upcoming book coming out called McCartney Legacy, which is a new definitive biography series on Paul McCartney written by someone named Alan Cozen. Isn't that funny? Someone has your name, Alan. Mm, Amazing. Actually, someone, someone else does. I, I went to a dentist <laughs> called Alan Cozen for a while. Uh, <laughs> did you really? Yes, I did. <laughs> he didn't say, was it safe? <laughs> <laughs> you do that, you walk out of there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it's written by me and also Adrian Sinclair, who is um, a British guy who is a documentary film editor and um, he's I've also heard a number of audio projects he's done uh, that are Beatles related and just brilliant but uh, mm. you know those are those are just sort of as a hobby but um, he's a killer researcher and uh, you know he the way we have divided the labor um, he's doing a lot of the research I'm doing some of it I mean when, for interviews we're sort of splitting them up depending on you know who's where and who's available you know of us and uh, and all of that so I've done a bunch of interviews He's done a bunch of interviews. He's done a lot of the library research, you know, reading every single newspaper from the period and getting every, you know, mention of McCartney out of there. Uh, You know, not that we're just going to be putting together newspaper clips, but you know what? A lot of those clips, it's very interesting when you start researching this kind of thing. Um, you know, they were in the newspaper and now are entirely forgotten and have some really interesting information. And so, you know, we're using that as a source. We're doing interviews. We have a lot of paperwork. Um, we have correspondence. Um, we've had access to people's diaries. Uh, so, you know, it's um, basically the idea is that we are focusing on Paul's post Beatles work. So we've, our publisher, which is uh, Day Street, which is a division of HarperCollins, is contracted to do the first two volumes. And the first two volumes are basically the wing story. Um, You know, the first will take through 1973, so you get the breakup of Wings Mark I, so to speak, um, and the recording of Band on the Run, and then, you know, and I guess we can take it through the release of Band on the Run, and then it picks up in 1974 with, um, you know, I suppose in a way you could say it starts with McGear, because Wings plays on McGear, and uh, there were a lot of sort of scouting for new wings members uh mm. during those sessions and 
and then we'll take that through 1979, 1980, probably 1980. Uh, and we might actually step out sideways since the beginning of the first book is outside wings, really. It's a McCartney album. It kind of makes sense to end those first two books with McCartney, too. Mm. Um, how many more books beyond the first two? We're not sure. Um, we think in an ideal world, we'd like to do three more volumes. Um, when I mentioned that to our publisher uh, last week, I, I think her eyes widened and uh, her, I believe I saw her head shaking no, but so they would prefer four. But, uh, you know, it'll depend how the first two do. And, you know, we think that we have a lot of stuff that corrects things that are in all the other McCartney bios, even the good ones. You know, just a lot of things are wrong. You know, there are dates that are wrong. There are stories that, uh, you know, stories even that Paul has told lots of times that are just not exactly what happened. And uh, we'll go through all of that stuff. I mean, it's going to be, I think, a very respectful book. It's not going to you know, we're not going to say, oh, yeah, yeah, Paul got this wrong. It, it, it's like, okay, this is the official story. This is what the contracts and the paperwork and everything else tells us and other people we've interviewed who were involved. So we're having a great time. I mean, we've been working on this for maybe five years. <laughs> uh, um, and it started as a very different project. In fact, um, we discussed it a bit on this show when we had Chip Manninger as a guest. And Chip was, uh, I think we had decided to announce then that we were going to do this thing and that Chip was part of the team. And he was. And in fact, Chip was going to publish it as part on his own imprint, which, you know, Open Your Box Books, which is the same company that he's bringing out the Lennon series on and it kind of made sense to all of us to you know have the McCartney series and the Lennon series in the same group of publications uh, and it also would have meant for us it would have meant a, you know we would have been able to use his research for eight arms to hold you but um, in the end we had sort of different ideas about how to do it chip with his publishing company had a house style that he wanted us to adhere to that we felt made sense for the Lennon books, but doesn't necessarily make sense for McCartney books. You know, for instance, you know, Chip adopted, I think, from Mark Lewison's Tune In, the idea of no foreknowledge. You know, there's no talking, there, you're reading the book um, as like a thriller, right? You know, it's unfolding before your eyes. We're not saying that we know that they'll eventually record when I'm 64, when they're talking about Paul being 16 and writing it, you know? So, uh, and, and that works with Lennon as well, because uh, he recorded in a different way than Paul. I mean, what I was just saying about all those outtakes and things, there's not quite as much of that for Lennon. Um, whereas with Paul, he might record something for Ram, and it might not turn up till Red Rose Speedway or even later. And, um, you know, we need the flexibility. I mean, I think we're going to try and do it more or less Chip's way without the foreknowledge, without saying what's going to happen. Mm. Um, but there are certain things where, at least in a footnote, you have to point out you know, that something will end up someplace else, even if it's not being used here. But, you know, we're hoping to give session dates and, um, you know, how the things were recorded. And we've talked to engineers, band members, have some more lined up. So it's exciting for us anyway. Yeah. And this will be coming out the first volume in the fall of 2021. Right. And the second volume in the fall of 2023. Mm. Okay, I can't wait. Mm. You know, from what I from what I read from the the Facebook posts, it says that it will also cover that's if you include his entire career here, mm -hmm. his classical music, right? Visual art, yep. Film, poetry, and children's, children's books. books. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and and I guess now we have to add musicals. Have we by the yes. way mentioned that as a news item? Well, that's a perfect segue, <laughs> Alan. <laughs> Because that was the next thing I was going to talk about. 
<laughs> See, it's been a few weeks since our last show, and right after our last show, news broke about Paul writing uh, a musical, a stage version of the Frank Capra film, the classic It's a Wonderful Life. From what we know, he'll be writing the music for this and co-collaborating on the lyrics with screenwriter and playwright Lee Hall, who is the screenwriter behind Billy Elliot and also Rocket Man. Mm-hmm. Uh, theater and film impresario Bill Kenwright is producing the show. And Paul said this in a press release. Like many of these things, this all started with an email. Bill had asked if it was something I might be up for. Writing a musical is not something that had ever really appealed to me, but Bill and I met up with Lee Hall and had a chat, and I found myself thinking this could be interesting and fun. It's a wonderful life. is a universal story we can all relate to. Mm-hmm. That's his quote. And Paul apparently has nearly finished all the songs for the musical, and according to both the New York Post and Variety, they're saying it's likely to debut in the U.K. in late 2020, before coming to Broadway. Mm -hmm. I was thrilled to hear this news. And I was really surprised that um, we didn't hear anything about it because this has been in the works for uh, apparently a year or so. And usually this news leaks out. Yeah. Especially a lot of McCartney news leaks out long before anything uh, is released of what he's talking about. But we never heard anything about this really until then. So uh, a big shock to me and even more of a shock is that it's taken him this long to do one. That's, so uh, That's true, because, you know, Liverpool Oratorio could have been a musical. could have been opera, really, but it could have been a musical, certainly. Uh-huh. You know, all it needed was some staging. So, in fact, maybe, right. maybe one day he'll return to that and, you know, have someone stage it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that, I'd like to see that happen. Mm-hmm. But... The one thing that comes to mind when I heard about this is that I always remember Paul talking about how he and John once went to see Oklahoma in the movie theater, and they thought it was so corny, the musical. And yet Paul is someone who's so diverse musically, liking everything, liking dance hall music and a lot of pre-rock and roll stuff, as they all did, really. And, you know, liking vaudeville, liking Fred Astaire, (laughs) you know, I pictured him doing musicals. I don't know why he held off doing this. He would, to me, be a natural, certainly for the melodies. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, well, better late than never. So, well, we'll see. I mean, A Wonderful Life was like everyone's favorite movie to some degree, you know, and it's a movie i mean i've never run into anyone who doesn't like it uh and the question you have to ask is like do you want this to be a musical you know Mm. um i'm not a fan of musicals to tell you the truth so i mean apart from you know certain sondheim ones and west side story and stuff like that contemporary musicals don't like him at all um so i'm really curious to see what he does because um he doesn't write thank god like andrew lloyd weber <laughs> you know <laughs> i knew you were going to stick that in there Al. <laughs> well you, know, you, you can't not because when you talk about contemporary musicals like he's the you know big elephant in the room <laughs> um, he's the leading guy whether you like it or not you know yeah so yeah anyway We'll see how that goes. I mean, and and from our point of view, as the you know biographers of his post Beatles solo work, it's yet another thing to look into. So, uh, but I mean, God knows when we'll get to that volume. Um, but uh, volume nine, yeah, right, right. I mean, he may outlive us. <laughs> so, um, yeah. All right. Um, something that got a lot of buzz a few weeks ago was word that Paul said that he's planning to release an album of him and his band of improvised outtakes from sound checks, mm-hmm. which Paul has called a treasure trove of material that they've been continuing to record over the years. We don't know if this is really going to happen. Paul could have just put it out there to see what the reaction yeah. would be, but um, you never know with him. I mean, this reminds me very much of Tripping the Live Fantastic when he put what he called trinkets in there. Mm-hmm. Songs from the sound checks. Mm-hmm. Would he do a whole album of something like that? I don't know. I, that that would be great if he did that. I loved that concept of tripping the live fantastic. It, 
you know, kind of spruced up the same old, same old live album concept. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that would be very cool if that happened. Yeah. And uh, as I pointed out, it's actually been 10 years now since Good Evening New York City. Paul is really due for a, a new live album. And there's so much stuff that he's done since that album live that's never come out officially, audio wise. And even prior to that, in the 2000s, there are songs that he hasn't released on audio, maybe on video, with uh, like The Space Within Us, for example. There's so much material there that I'd love to have on CD. Mm -hmm. Anyway, a few more things. Paul will be appearing on a forthcoming tribute single to Henry McCullough, the first lead guitarist in Wings. Mm -hmm. um, Henry, as we know, came from Joe Cocker's Grease Band, joined Wings as part of their first lineup, beginning with the single of Give Ireland Back to the Irish, and uh, also on Red Rose Speedway and the early tours with Wings. And uh, he left the group right before they headed to Lagos, Nigeria, to record their Band on the Run album. A single will be coming out called Long Live Rock and Roll as a tribute to Henry, and Paul is playing bass on the song. Mm -hmm. The song was co-written by Henry along with Don Mescal. Uh, the song was pieced together by a band that includes Procol Harum's Gary Brooker, Pink Floyd drummer Nick Mason. I know you'll like that, Darren. Yay. Uh, legendary guitarist Albert Lee, and more. The single is due out very soon, August the 16th. And also, I think we did mention this in a previous show, not sure, but singer-songwriter Thelma Plum, P-L-U-M, who comes from Gamma Lurai, uh, is so releasing... Sorry. What's that? I said, so do I. <laughs> she is releasing her debut album called Better in Black, that's B-L-A-K, and Paul McCartney makes a guest appearance on that. We have to put that in volume 10, mm -hmm. Alan. Um, this follows Plum's EP called Monsters, released in 2014. Paul wrote guitar parts for the song that closes the album, uh, and it's the song called Made for You. Thelma said, it's this beautiful, simple guitar line. It was so perfect for the song. Plum is currently embarking on a tour of Australia. And also, we shouldn't fail to mention that Ringo Starr has kicked off his 30th anniversary All-Star Band Tour with a date in Windsor, Ca uh, Canada, on August the 1st. And his tour will run through all of August, ending September 1st at the Greek Theater in Los Angeles. After the tour, Ringo will be busy putting out his next book of photos, Another Day in the Life, and finishing up his next studio album, for which he says, I'm actually pretty far along. Mm -hmm. So no mention of a title yet or a release date for the album. That's all the news I have. Okay. All right. Good job, Ken. Thank you, Darren. Take it away. Uh, topic time. Today's topic's going to uh, deal with the album Revolver. And uh, we decided to just pluck this album out of the air in this month of August, uh, the month it was released in 1966, and and discuss whether or not it is the best Beatles album. Is it the most popular Beatles album? Should it be the best Beatles album? And all things in between, including can you actually have a best Beatles album? You know, all the talk uh, has been centered around anniversaries in, in the last couple of years, Sgt. Pepper's 50th, and then uh, that kind of opened up the floodgates to then examine the White Album last year for the 50th Abbey Road coming up. I think it's safe to say we'll have a, a look at Let It Be next year for the 50th anniversary. Revolver, really one of those albums that missed out, like Rubber Soul before it, in getting that big anniversary deluxe treatment. So, you know, we decided uh, in this month of August to talk a bit about Revolver, where we think it stands, and uh, maybe uh, stir up some conversations amongst yourselves about the album. I think what has happened through the years is Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band usually gets heralded as the Beatles' masterpiece. And it seems that in, in, in recent years especially, there has been some questioning of whether or not musically Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band is the one. And that has opened the doors to Revolver being discussed as possibly being the best. Let's see. Let's pick the brains of Darren, Allen, and Ken and see what they have to say. 
So uh, I guess, I don't know, who wants to start? How about you, Alan? Yeah, Alan, I was just going to say, how about we go with Alan in alphabetical order? Oh, okay. (laughs) Okay, Um, I guess I would come down on the there is no best Beatles album side of things. Um, But, you know, that said, the, the... um, history of, uh, let's say, reception of Revolver has been kind of interesting. I mean, um, for a very long time, everyone thought, you know, you, you could find people split between Sergeant Pepper and Abbey Road for reasons that should be obvious, you know, of, of those two were people's favorites. But, you know, they're all spectacular albums, and Revolver, I think, was a latecomer to the This Is My Favorite Album uh, uh, discussion in the U.S., partly because the Revolver that we got was the, the truncated Revolver. I mean, we got a Revolver that was missing three songs, although by the time Revolver came out, we actually had those three songs, but in the context of Yesterday and Today. Right. Yeah. So we grew up with a revolver that was, you know, a really good revolver, but it wasn't all of revolver. You know, it was, uh, you know, there were 14 tracks on the British album. We had, you know, 11. So, you know, it, it, it's not like there's extraneous stuff on the American album, but it, it just wasn't the full picture. Uh, and I think that since, I mean, you know, a lot of us, sort of switched to the British albums fairly early after discovering them. But for, I think, most people uh, in the United States, the American albums were the albums until the 1987 CD releases, which adopted the British format. And people have been living with the albums in that way ever since. And I have a feeling that maybe hearing the full Revolver won it more fans than it had before. But, I mean, I remember when it came out and, you know, I mean, it had Yellow Submarine on it and which was the big hit at the time, you know, that and during that 66 tour during which they didn't play it, strangely. Well, not that strangely. Um, you know, if, if, if they were touring now, you just put some of the sound effects and things on a, a sampler key and, and you're all set. You can do it. But in those days, it was a little harder. Uh, not to mention the brass band, all that stuff. But, you know, it is an incredible album, and I uh, I don't know why I didn't consider it up to Pepper, let's say. I don't know if I didn't consider it up to Pepper. I just liked Pepper better because of a whole lot of reasons that weren't necessarily just musical, like, you know, the cover and the time period it came out in and, you know, just the, the whole... There's There's a magic about Pepper that is different from the magic of every one other one of their albums. And it's a more colorful kind of magic. And, uh, uh, it was stuff we hadn't heard before in terms of effects and sounds and all of that. And yet you go back to revolver and you hear the roots of all of that. Uh, and I didn't think about that at the time, you know, at the time revolver seemed to me a fairly conventional, Beatles album. I mean, you always expect them to make big leaps from album to album, and they did. You know, you got the electronic stuff, you got the backwards stuff, you've got some really freaky things like Tomorrow Never Knows, um, you've got hard rockers, you've got everything on here. You got Eleanor Rigby. You know, it was one of their albums that just like left no bass untouched. And then Pepper did that, and it seemed to do it more in you know technicolor in fact take the two album covers you know revolvers black and white pepper is you know pepper um it 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 seemed to be musically kind of like that too like pepper just sort of exploded into all this sort of psychedelia um but you know if you if you listen seriously to revolver the roots of all that are there and it's uh it's really an incredible album so I don't have any favorite Beatles album at this point. You know, it used to be Pepper. Um, can't say that now. It's it's sort of they're all amazing. You know, I've always been fascinated. I would love to go back in time to see people's reactions to hearing, fans' reactions to hearing Revolver for the first time. 
and I, and I'll let you go. I, I didn't want to lose this uh, thought, Ken, but I, I wanted to jump in here, and then I'll let you do your thing with Revolver, Ken. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, being that Alan mentioned hearing it and experiencing it at the time, I mean, I was one when it came out. So my, and I think the same can be said for uh, Ken's experience. I discovered the albums in no particular order. It took time. It took years after hearing and learning about the albums to get as I found out more and more and more and more books were getting published. I put things in the chronological order and see how everything ran from Please Please Me or in our case, Meet the Beatles. But I always want, wished I could see the reaction of uh, Beatle fans in 1966 when they heard Revolver for the first time. Because to my ears today, that was probably the first album I would have heard that would have made my head explode. Because it was musically, when it comes to songwriting and all of that, the uh, maturation process was, was natural. It was the natural step after Rubber Soul. Sonically, Revolver was the one that just blew the roof off off the building in my estimation uh in a way that might have made it uh i don't know maybe made even a a bigger mark on me if i were if i was aware of its uh existence in 66 maybe more than sergeant pepper because once revolver came out you were expecting all right they blew the roof off the house with revolver now they'll take out the walls uh you would expect (laughs) that you know the first major like holy smoke would have been Revolver. His first major reaction like that would have been the Revolver album. And again, all of that I missed out on because I probably Revolver was one of the last albums I might have been introduced to growing up in the 70s. So, but anyway, I, I just wanted to just jump off something Alan said. Let me just so, jump off something you said, which is um, <laughs> as we've had as a guest on this show a couple of times, Candy Leonard. Hmm. Um, who I don't know if you've read her book Beetleness, but in Beetleness she discusses a lot about the reactions that um, fans had to Revolver at, at the time it came out. It, it didn't really reflect my experience, but uh, you know she's a good researcher and she interviewed a lot of people, and you know I, I trust what what she put in there. But you know she sort of felt that people were terrified by it. You know, were scared. Mm. By the I just think, blowing the roof off the house, you know. <laughs> it's a funny, funny observation because I could see "Tomorrow Never Knows" or "Love, Love You Too" maybe having that effect on younger Beatle fans, mm-hmm. maybe ones who were picking up on the Beatles a couple of years after their older brothers and sisters saw Ed Sullivan. Because I could tell you from experience that you know my name. Look up the number. The B side of "Let It Be" came out in '70, and I was five. You know my name, look up the number, used to totally creep me out as a five-year-old getting my first Beatle records and hearing things for the first time. Um, So I could see a young fan exposed to the Beatles getting totally freaked out by things like Tomorrow Never Knows or other moments on Revolver. It's really interesting that you brought that up about Candy Leonard, Alan, because I was going to mention her too because I'm always reminded about what she said in her book that for some people the Beatles going from well even Rubber Soul was such a a big change at that point but Revolver was such a a radical change from Rubber Soul that they were evolving so quickly that a lot of fans couldn't handle that it was too big a change and so for some of those fans they went and discovered the monkeys (laughs) you know because the monkeys music was more innocent and it was more, it reflected more of what the Beatles sound was maybe a year before that. And they were used to that. So, um, yeah, it, that was a very interesting thing that she brought out in the book there that I had never known before. But like what you were just saying, Darren, I had kind of a similar experience. When Revolver came out, I was only six. And so I heard the Beatles music from I Want to Hold Your Hand On from, uh, you know, the age of four on and i was hearing all their music as it came out but i wasn't absorbing it like you know even uh, a teenager would you know it was it was a natural progress the music to me nothing really shocked me all that much there was some weird stuff that uh, that i had trouble adapting to like i am the walrus and certainly revolution number nine what the hell was that all about (laughs) as a little kid you know you couldn't possibly understand what they were doing there but you know their music 
gradually progressed that, you know, to me, where it was easy for me to, to take in Revolver. And, uh, you know, I find it also fascinating now. And I'm wondering, before I give you my thoughts about Revolver, I wanted to ask you, Alan, because you being the slightly elder statesman mm -hmm. of the three of us, was the, the progress going from Rubber Soul to Revolver a stark contrast to you? Or did it really help to have yesterday and today sandwiched in between there? So you already had I'm Only Sleeping. You got a, you know, a bit of the, the psychedelia, the psychedelic Beatles in there. You know, it, it, it pointed towards where they were going. Absolutely. So you already had that in there. So Yeah, yesterday and today was kind of a bridge. Um, and so you didn't get, in a way, the the stark difference between Rubber Soul and Revolver. If you grew up in the U.S. and were listening to those records, you, you already had a, you know, a hint of Revolver before Revolver came out. Um, but, you know, if you think about it, the things on Yesterday and Today, which are I'm Only Sleeping, uh, Dr. And your Robert, bird can sing. and And Your Bird Can Sing, I mean, in a certain way, those are sort of... Well, I'm not. I'm only sleeping. Isn't really conventional because it's got the backwards guitar solos and it's, uh, it's you know got this sort of weird dreaminess. Um, but it's not like it was tomorrow never knows. And she said, she said, you know. Mm. Um, on the other hand, it also wasn't the you know peak ballads of Revolver either. You know, it wasn't Good Day Sunshine and Here There and Everywhere. So mm. there were still plenty of surprises to be had on Revolver. But it, you know, like you say, having yesterday and today in between there, just sort of was was like a bridge. But also yesterday and today was such a mishmash. I mean, it had stuff from Help. You, you know, yesterday itself. Right. Um, and. Uh, you know, it just just bits that had been left off Rubber Soul or gotten early from Revolver, and uh, it you know uh, we didn't know that that much at the time. I mean, you know that it it was like oh, new Beatles album. Some of the singles are on here. This is great, you know. Yeah, but for I'm, me, once I started getting used to the British albums, mm -hmm. which really didn't happen until everything was on CD in 1987, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. man, what a difference! between Rubber Soul and Revolver. And um, I often call it the greatest creative leap the Beatles went from one album to the next. And when you think about the diversity that's in Revolver, which the Beatles carried on with on Sgt. Pepper and the White Album, definitely. Mm -hmm. But um, it's just so amazing the leaps that they took creatively in terms of the lyrics, what they were writing about. Mm -hmm. I mean, something like She Said, She Said, you know, coming from a conversation with Peter Fonda, hearing a line like, I know what it's like to be dead yeah. in a pop record. Yeah. You know, you wouldn't have had that even in Rubber Soul. <laughs> you know, you wouldn't have had it. Yeah, you know, it's so different. And same thing with Tomorrow Never Knows. Mm -hmm. And you could see the signs of with I'm Only Sleeping, the whole, you know, kind of uh, hallucinatory type songs of John's, like Strawberry Fields Forever, for example. You know, I think that's like a precursor to that in a way. Sure. And then all the different sounds, which, you know, as a little kid, you couldn't possibly process. You have to learn by reading what was going on in the studio. You know, Jeff Emmerich played such a big part in the sound of Revolver, and probably his biggest accomplishment, although it's debatable, is the close miking technique that was used on the instrumentation mm -hmm. because everything like the strings on Eleanor Rigby, they were right in your face. Mm -hmm. The horns on got to get you into my life. The Indian instruments on love you too. It really helped to create that sound. And, um, you know, you hear so much about not just revolver, but a lot, so much of the Beatle records that other artists later on would say, I want John's voice on tomorrow. Never knows for this, you know, or trying to get that kind of a sound. They did so much, they expanded so much in terms of the compositions, the way it was recorded. It was the greatest leap to me creatively. But like you said, Alan, I'm finding it all the more difficult to say what the Beatles' best album is, really. Favorites for mine can change from year to year. Mm -hmm. But best, how do you say Revolver is better than Abbey Road, you know, or, or Sgt. Pepper or the White Album? And there's a lot of people that I've talked to in all my years doing Beatles radio programs that love Rubber Soul the most. 
I even had one fan tell me they, they like a hard day's night the most. There's nothing that captures the energy of all the original songs that are on a hard day's night. You can love each Beatle album for different reasons. And, uh, you know, but Revolver is a stunner for me. Even after hearing this music hundreds and probably thousands of times, once you get used to the order of things to go from the British rubber soul to Revolver is, is absolutely stunning. It's, it's, it's in some ways like two different bands. And I always remember George Harrison's comment in the Beatles anthology that, you know, Revolver could have been Rubber Soul Part 2, which I don't understand at all. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't yeah. get it, you know. But um, I do understand from, from the perspective of Revolver not being as produced and as layered as Sgt. Pepper was. You know, it was, a, it was still a fairly raw album, despite the instrumentation of strings on Eleanor Rigby and horns on, you know, Got to Get You to My Life and, you know, tape hey, loops. And being at, yeah, but still, you know, it wasn't as complicated production-wise as uh, Sgt. Pepper was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that, that comment of George's is um, a little puzzling, but um, I th think if you sort of reconfigure it a bit what he may have meant was that you know rubber soul was so acoustic and revolver was so electronic it doesn't totally hold because you still got rigby on there and you still got uh you know here there and everywhere but you know as as an overall sort of feel revolver is is much more sort of out there and uh electric and amplified and um full of strange new techniques whereas rubber soul sort of has a, a an overall acoustic feel although not all of it you know there's plenty of electric stuff on there too yeah i mean that's the best i i can make of 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 that comment because when he says uh, it seems like part one and part two, you know, really, Revolver and Pepper seem to me more like part one and part two. Hmm. I could see that. Yeah. Interesting. They don't hmm. to me, but I know I could, I, I understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. See, uh, I, I, again, this is interesting, and this is not the first time that I've been sitting here doing the show while we're recording it. We're actually uh, sharing our thoughts for the first time where my opinions change and and i learn a little something or think about something a little differently than i did an hour ago before we start hit record yesterday and today kind of even though i didn't experience the albums in chronological order i mean to me getting exposed to beatles music happened mostly at christmas time in the 70s because that's when i would get beatle albums along with other albums as christmas gifts uh, and in some instances, they were or albums I wasn't even didn't even know existed. Uh, and and the number one that pops into my head is Magical Mystery Tour. I didn't know what Magical Mystery Tour was. I think <laughs> I knew there was a song, but when I received the album as a Christmas gift in the mid seventies, probably by the time I was around eleven, I didn't know what it was. It was basically Santa Claus. Uh, I later just found out last week that Santa was my mother uh, all this time. <laughs> Basically going into the record department, probably in a Corvette or into a Sam Goody or something like that, and asking for help. My son likes the Beatles. Okay, what should, you know, what do you suggest? Or something like that. So I didn't get the Beatle albums in chronological order, but I do remember receiving one Christmas yesterday and today in Rubber Soul at the same time. And um, those two albums kind of, I now know are what the differences of them are. But to me, they were part A and part B. And then by the time years later, I heard Revolver from beginning to end for the first time. Revolver didn't have the impact to my ears. Why? Because I heard a few of Revolver songs years earlier on yesterday and today. Didn't know they were, you know, cut from the Revolver cloth. Mm. So all of that kind of blurs for me. When it comes to the album. From my hodgepodge of, a, of a, a learning experience, I feel like you it's unquestionable Sgt. Pepper is the album because of the complete effect it had. The songs were strong and hold up well with other Beatle albums. Is it the best? 
I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But they are great songs on Sgt. Pepper. So that's taken care of. But Sgt. Pepper also had its effect on culture, its effect on, uh, on music. Uh, on society at the time, it being a reflection of the times, it being a groundbreaking album visually, uh, little nuances that we take for granted today that were innovative at the time, inserts, giveaway items coming with an album, a gatefold sleeve for a pop album, not the first, but done in such a way that really caught everyone's attention, a gatefold with a multicolored picture of the band inside and and uh, the whole the whole package, the package, the music, its effect on society, uh, its effect on culture, it being a benchmark and uh, popular music makes Sgt. Pepper the best album. The other albums didn't have that. The White Album did not come have, I think, the type of, uh, trying to think of the right way of putting it, the same kind of effect, say, for example, uh, on... Um, culture that sergeant pepper had does that make sense if you know what i'm saying yeah, definitely. uh if you strip all of the uh, uh visual stuff away and the influence uh it had and just look at the songs pound for pound no sergeant pepper is not the best and revolver stands up with all of the beatle albums but i ultimately then come come back to you really can't ultimately say there's a best beatle album because you can make the argument that Ab Abbey Road's the best. You can make the argument Revolver's the best. I've kind of been looking at the White Album a little differently the past few months since the reissue came out last year. And you can make the argument that the White Album's the best. Some could even say Magical Mystery Tour, which was a creation of uh, a record company, uh, holds its own with all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've heard it many times that people think some people think Magical Mystery Tour song for song was better than Sgt. Pepper. Mm -hmm. I've heard that too. I think it's all kind of so blurred when it comes to the Beatles that you can't really say the best album. Your favorite album is, but the best album, there is no such thing when it comes to the Beatles. But Sgt. Pepper as being a, uh, uh, an album that had an impact across so many different areas of life makes, I think, Sgt. Pepper... Uh, the best album in so much influence and the whole kit and caboodle. I've had all, I had all these great thoughts coming into the show and now I'm drawing a blank on, you know, um, on the album's impact. Well, the, the accepted way to phrase it these days is that Sgt. Pepper may not have been the Beatles' best album, but it was their most important album. Right. In, in so... In one sentence, Ken basically made sense of all my rambling thoughts. <laughs> you know, Sgt. Pepper know. had that impact across the boards in ways that albums didn't have an impact in the 1960s or, or ever, for that matter. Sgt. Pepper did have that impact. People still talk about, I remember bringing it home and playing it for the first time. You don't hear that as much. I remember he getting Let It Be for the first time and playing it and... Wow. You know, you do hear that about Sgt. Pepper. And I'm into album art. I mean, we all are. You look at all the, 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 all the groundbreaking things about the cover alone mm -hmm. uh, that sort of put it head and shoulders above the other Beatle albums when you're looking at an album as a full experience. Right. Alan, didn't the, the front cover of Revolver shock a lot of fans, too? being that artistic, what Klaus Foreman did? I, I don't remember thinking that. I thought it was, kind, it was you know, interesting because of the, the drawing and the real eyes and uh, you know, all the pictures sort of stuck in there, pictures from you know, several different eras of the Beatles. Um, but it, it didn't strike me as shocking. But, you know, Revolver, I was like 12. You know, I wasn't thinking in terms of shocking and I wasn't, you know, I thought in terms of, like, you know, it, what the progress was from the last album I had heard, you know, whether it was, you know, I liked it as much, um, which generally I did. But I didn't think of, you know, another concept that uh, Darren mentioned, uh, maturity or in, in maturing, you know, which, for instance, in Here, There, and Everywhere, and For No One, I mean, those are... 
those are songs that are a universe apart from I Want to Hold Your Hand and She Loves You, you know. Um, those are very sophisticated songs. And I didn't think of them in terms of that kind of comparison. I just thought of them in terms of, okay, here's a bunch of new Beatles stuff. Which ones do I like most? Is there, are there any I don't like? You know, which can I try and figure out how to play? You know, but so I, I, don't, I don't remember anything being really shocking. I remember things being shocking to other people about Sgt. Pepper, like, you know, I'd love to turn you on in a day in the life. People seem to go nuts about that, uh, especially, mm. like, you know, parents. <laughs> but I don't remember there being much about Revolver that that did that. Yeah. Um, that's why, in a way, you know, I mean, uh, Darren is, is correct when he... And, and you know, and you too, when you talk about you know the effect of Pepper as a whole, you know, Pepper as a whole, you know, when Revolver came out, it was wow, new Beatles albums here, let's listen to it. But with Pepper, it really was a magnified event, you know, just globally, mm. um, and that was kind of a first, you know, I mean, a, a first since maybe the Sullivan or the movies or whatever, you know, those things were big events too globally but an album wasn't quite treated as like such an exceptional event as pepper you know until pepper uh, you know it subsequently i mean there was quite a bit about abbey road there was a bit about the white album too but in a way that was i thought because of the way pepper was treated as such a, a an incredible event and you know after pepper everyone was looking very closely at what they were doing and whether it was as good as pepper and you know people weren't saying is it as good as revolver they were just saying is it as good as pepper is a white album going to be as good right. as pepper mm. um, people didn't look back beyond beyond pepper when in searching for uh, you know whether it was you know, better then. Would you say that with Sgt. Pepper, it was appreciated immediately, whereas Revolver and even Rubber Soul has taken many more years for people to come to realize all the progress the Beatles were making as songwriters and as musicians and recording artists? Yeah, I think so. I think because Pepper was such an event and so lauded at the time, you know, it, it was sort of instantly accepted um, even, you know, for whatever shock value lines like you, I love to turn you on and, and you know, all of a day in the life really blew his mind out in a car. I mean, what's what kind of subject is that for a pop song, too? You know, uh, it's up there with uh, I know what it's like to be dead, but, you know, <laughs> right. in, in a way. So maybe it was less shocking because we already had I know what it's like to be dead. <laughs> And turn off your mind, relax, and float downstream. Yeah, but I think I think you're right. I think Revolver's the you know the appreciation of Revolver as an extraordinary you know work as a total work didn't come about until after Pepper, and I think really way after Pepper. You know, uh, when Robert Rodriguez wrote his book about Revolver, saying that you know he he thought it was. The Beatles' best album. I mean, that was the first time I ever I remember hearing anybody say that. It it just wasn't something that was you know it, it was just natural to think that Pepper was, and you might think Abbey Road was, but I, I never heard anyone say Revolver. And I think uh, you know it's been the last few years really listening to it closely again and saying, well, wait a minute, why why did we sort of overlook Revolver? I mean, that, overlook is maybe too strong because everyone liked it, but why didn't we think Revolver was up there in consideration for the greatest Beatles album? You know, it's, it, it, it definitely has a lot going for it. Well, you know, that's how I remember it, that Sgt. Pepper was always the album that was the greatest album ever, not just by the Beatles. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it, as I see it, it's only, you know, as we've said in recent years, that Revolver has gotten this this newfound respect. But then one of our listeners and guest here on the show, Mike Lynch, remembers that Beatle fan back in the 80s was writing about Revolver as though it was their best album. Hmm. So, you know, I don't remember that. I'm sure it's true. But, uh you know, I've seen surveys like with Mojo, where Revolver was the number one album of all rock albums. But then I've also seen recent ones from 
a recent one from Rolling Stone where Sgt. Pepper was back to being number one. So, I don't know. I think that um, if you take the album apart and just examine the individual parts, just the individual songs, you can make the argument Revolver is as good as the Beatles get. Add on top of Revol- on top of that the sonic innovations. As I mentioned at the beginning, that to me was the thing with Revolver where they really took off. So add the sonic innovations on top of the fact that, you know, every song's a winner. And, you know, there are some all-time, all-time, super uber Beatle all-time moments like Eleanor Rigby on Revolver that would cause people to think that way now looking back. If you looked at them individual song for song and compared the two albums, I hear Revolver being better than Sgt. Pepper. Uh, and maybe the White Album's hard because there's so much going on there. You know, it, you, it's like a lightning rod of an album because you can have so many different opinions about the White Album that it's very hard to kind of get a group of people together to agree on it. Revolver was virtual perfection, song for song. So, uh, yeah, and, and Magical Mystery Tour, again, as I said before, I mean, those in the known might have known that this was a not a Beatle album, really. You know what I'm saying? But Revolver really was, I mean, it's a killer group of songs, not a weak one in there, and had the, you know, the sonic innovation uh, thing going for it as well. Mm. Yeah, there's so many things that I deeply appreciate about Revolver now that I didn't before. And, you know, you might think certain, certain things are so obvious, but it's only in recent years that it, it just dawned on me that Eleanor Rigby, apart from being a great composition itself, is just vocals and strings. I mean, what other pop song has that? No guitars. Right. No pianos. Obviously no drums. Just vocals and a string section. See, that would have been a little a little uh, nuance that was lost on me. Because by the time I heard it and got it, every artist in existence had done a nice song that just had, you know, something other than traditional rock instrumentation. Mm-hmm. You know, when if I, if I would have heard it in 66 for the first time, bringing my copy of Revolver home, maybe I would have, you know, that would have really resonated with me. But that's something that just went totally over my head. Yeah. But you could hear that song hundreds of times and never stop to think it's just vocals and strings. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's just extraordinary, you know, to me. And I also really appreciate For No One so much more now than I ever did. I always loved the song, but... I've really come to appreciate the economy of words in For No One. It tells a story in very few words, mm-hmm. which is not easy to do in just two minutes. You know, and Love You Too being the first full-blown Indian song that the Beatles did. That must have been somewhat complicated for a very, very young George Harrison to accomplish. Mm-hmm. You know, little things like that. So, Yeah. <laughs> What can you add to that? I think what we've talked about here with Revolver is essentially it is and it isn't the best Beatles album. And there really isn't one, as, 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 we, as Alan pointed out at the very beginning of the discussion. And that I would think that Revolver would be a great addition to these, uh, to these collections of, of box sets coming out, these archival releases coming out that they started with Sgt. Pepper. And, you know, no reason to believe that once the 50th anniversary of Let It Be passes, that Apple won't now go back. Whether or not they tie the reissue into an anniversary, the 55th or whatever uh, anniversary. But, you know, I think Revolver would be an enormously interesting multi-disc deluxe reissue to hear that stuff being built, those songs being put together. Mm Mm-hmm. But, again, you can make the case that it could be the Beatles' best musically. It, it, it can't hold it, you know, hold, you know, stand next to Sgt. Pepper because it didn't have all the other stuff going for it that Sgt. Pepper has. And can you really ultimately come up with the definitive best Beatles album? Probably not. Right. I agree. Uh, but the one thing is for certain, there is no denying and no questioning the fact that it is amongst the top five Beatle albums of all time. I think everyone would have it in their top five. 
so what do you think? Just let us know uh, if you feel that something you disagree with us, where you feel like, yes, Revolver can stand up next to Sgt. Pepper. Or uh, Beatles for Sale makes Revolver look like uh, an album of Bay City Rollers outtakes. <laughs> let us know. And with that, I guess we've come to the end of another edition of Things We Said Today. And we said a lot of things today. Let me tell you that. Uh, time to go around and uh, get each other's, everyone's contact information. If you want to reach out to us individually or know where we'd be at, so you could throw stuff at us. Start with Alan. Okay. You can reach me on Facebook uh, at either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Uh, you can reach all of us by email at things we said today radio show at gmail dot com. That's things we said today radio show one word at gmail dot com. We have a Twitter account, things we said fab, and a Facebook page, things we said today Beatles radio fans. All right, and Ken. Uh, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. I have a Facebook page for the name Ken Michaels. And I have my website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com. I do want to make mention of the fact that in the last few weeks, I've had the chance to interview a couple of uh, really fine people. <laughs> One of which, his last name is McCartney. It's not Paul. It's his brother, Michael because of the new reissue of McGear. And we did an interview that lasted close to two hours long, which uh, hopefully by the time this show goes up will be posted in its entirety on my website. My most recent page of interviews is interviews page four, so you'll find it on there. And I also did an interview with Michael Hill, who was one of John Lennon's childhood friends through grade school and high school. And um, I guess you'd have to say that the one person who was closest to John in his childhood before the Beatles came along was Pete Shotton. Michael would be another good friend of his, and they spent a lot of good a lot of times at his own house where they listened to records together during their lunchtime breaks. And that had a very big effect on John. And one particular record, which I won't mention, which he claims had a profound effect on John, enough to have him start a band of his own. He put out a book a few years ago called John Lennon, The Boy Who Became a Legend. It's by Michael A. Hill, and we talk about John's early years, his uh, childhood, all of his antics in his school days, and um, how he remembers John. Some stories in there that you probably didn't get to read about in Pete Shotton's book, which was also wonderful. So you have Michael's, uh, the interview with Michael Hill and the interview with Mike McCartney. Two Michaels for the price of one. But uh, the Mike McCartney interview was really interesting. Lots of talk about the McGear album. We talked about their dad a lot and uh, his early years in The Scaffold. So, again, that's at interviews page four on my website. Don't forget Beatles Trivia every week where you can win one of nine great prizes. And uh, that's all at KenMichaelsRadio.com. And um, that's about it because you gave me a, a whole commercial at the beginning of the show, Darren. So, <laughs> uh, My contact information, uh, pretty, uh, pretty basic. You can email me uh, directly at Darren DeVivo at WFUV.org, D-A-R-R-E-N-D-E-V-I-V-O uh, at WFUV.org, or go to Facebook. I have two pages, but the one that I would prefer you go to and click like is Darren DeVivo at WFUV Radio. That's the name of, the, uh, of, of that page. Uh, if you do send me a friend request at Darren DeVivo, I'll probably ultimately only ask you if you didn't mind, go over to the other page and click like over there. Uh, so that's uh, where you'll find me. I think by the time Monday, if you don't allow me uh, two seconds to plug something, I have been away from WFUV uh, since, since May 6th because of my knee injury. Uh, I had ripped up my left knee pretty bad and needed surgery and have been out of work uh, and have not been able to kind of basically get around well. Uh, so I have not been on the air at WFUV since early May. It's 
quite possible. I don't know for certain yet, but by the end of the month, by the end of August, I'll be back on the air during my regular shifts again, I'm hoping. But in the meantime, next Monday night, I say next Monday night, because we're recording this now on uh, on the 7th of August, the Wednesday, Monday night, the 12th, Tuesday, the 13th, and Wednesday, the 14th, 9 p.m. Eastern on WFUV, New York City, 90.7 FM. Stream it around the world at WFUV.org or get the WFUV app. I will be hosting three Woodstock specials, uh, a part one, part two, and a part three, celebrating the 50th anniversary of Woodstock. The actual anniversary is the 15th, 16th, 17th, and 18th of of August. And a few nights before that, I'll have three one-hour specials. I'll be playing a selection from almost all of the artists, uh, almost all of the 32 artists that appeared at the Woodstock Festival. So that'll be on WFUV on uh, Monday night, Tuesday night, and Wednesday night, the 12th, 13th, and 14th at 9 p.m. Eastern. Hmm. One other thing that we should mention is that um, I will be seeing Ringo Starr and his all-star band for a couple of concerts, as you will, Darren. So probably by the time we do our next show, we'll be able to talk about the concerts. Yes. I'll be at the uh, New York City show at uh, a relatively new venue that uh, I've never been uh, been to uh, by the South Street Seaport. That's Sunday the seventeenth, uh, Sunday the eighteenth, and you're seeing that on Long Island, right, Ken? I'm seeing him in Bethel, nice. the concert in Bethel, and also on Long Island in Farmingville. So two concerts in a row, two days and, in a row. <laughs> and be, being a Woodstock aficionado, I don't know if you've been to the museum yet. No, I never uh, have. It is like being uh, uh, it's holy ground up there. Let me just say that it's incredible. Okay, I'm going to make sure. Obviously, I'm going to be in the area, so well, I will make sure yeah, that uh, we see the it. hill is where the festival took place, from where the Bethel Woods Amphitheater is. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'll definitely check out the uh, museum. You have to, absolutely. And I just quickly want to mention one other thing that I've done recently that has just gone up, which is the latest episode of Swinging Through the 60s with Richard Buskin. This time I'm filling in for Eric Taros, who was ill. And the subject is the first part of the Let It Be sessions um, centering around George's departure. Uh, We play quite a bit of um, session tape, including a lot of the discussions that went on um, about where the concert would be and everything else it was, it was they were debating. Um, but we also look closely at whether a lot of the reported uh, you know, aspects of the Let It Be sessions, like John's heroin use and uh, the you know supposed bad feeling that went through all of it, um, some of which was there, but I think as everyone who's listened to all the Nagra tapes knows, it, it, it wasn't entirely like that. That is episode 30 of Swinging Through the 60s, and give it a listen. All right, so for Alan Cozen and Ken Michaels, I'm Darren DeVivo. This is Things We Said Today. We will see you again in a couple of weeks.